Okay, we're going to ask everyone, if you would, come on now, work your way back to your pew. Well, Ryan, just start playing. We lost them this morning. All right, go ahead. Tonight I can see a star shine And its splendor fills up the sky It's the same that appeared and the wise men revealed When hope was born this night Out upon the snowy fields There's a silent peace to hear And it echoes the grace of our because your was born this night. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to all men. Let all of the world sing a chorus of joy. Because your was born this night. I can hear the Christmas bells ring. As softly a church choir sings It's the song used to praise The ancient of days When hope was born this night There are angels in this place And my heart resounds with the praise Like a shepherd so scared I rejoice and declare That hope was born Glory to God in the highest Peace on earth, goodwill to all men Let all of the world sing a chorus of joy Because hope was born this night Glory Gloria Gloria The lesson today is from the first chapter of Philemon, starting with the eighth verse. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, 
but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have taken him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Here ends the reading. Well, as Pastor Paul mentioned earlier, this is the week four of our Advent season and also the fourth of our sermons in the series on gifts to be opened before Christmas. Now this morning, we're going to look at three actions that distinguish worldly Christians from world-class Christians. Worldly Christians live the world's way. World-class Christians live God's way, according to God's word. That's the best way to live in God's world. These actions are also wonderful gifts that we should not wait until Christmas or any other time. Right now, we should, we should be willing to accept and to give. They center on forgiveness, as does that little book in the Bible of Philemon. It's a short book, has no chapters, really. It has only 25 verses. It's a, a letter, a personal letter. It's written by St. Paul to his friend Philemon over in Colossae. Now, Colossae, if you don't know where that was, because it was, it's no longer there. It's in an area we refer to as Asia Minor. Right now, it would be located uh, a little northwest in Turkey. Now, Paul is writing to Philemon uh, from Rome. Paul is in prison there. Actually, he's in house arrest. He was in prison. He's released for a while. He'll go back to prison. He's writing this letter to his friend who is now the uh, leader of the Christian church in Colossae. At one time, he was a non-believer. Paul, St. Paul, converted him to Christianity. And, and for a while, Philemon worked with, with Paul in spreading the gospel. Now he's over in Colossae, heading up that church there in his own home. Paul is writing this letter on behalf of Philemon's runaway slave named Onesimus. Now, Onesimus, just like his master, somehow or other got connected with Paul and Paul led him to faith in Jesus Christ. And Philemon had been working with Paul, sharing the gospel. He's helping him while he's in, in, in house arrest. He's been a great help to him. And Paul is very grateful and very fond of Onesimus. He's writing this letter, asking, imploring his, his good friend to forgive his runaway slave. Now, bear in mind, uh, the penalty for a runaway slave at that time was, was awfully severe. I, I've read that in the Roman Empire, back in those days, they had some 60 million slaves. Now, in order to keep these men and women enslaved, they, they had to have very severe penalties. And if a slave ran away, they could be beaten severely. They could be branded right on the face so everybody would know they were runaways. They could even be crucified for having run away. Now, St. Paul, in his brief letter, he, he reminds Philemon that he too uh, once was a slave, a slave to sin before he came to know Jesus Christ. He reminds him that he owes Paul a big favor because Paul introduced him to Jesus Christ. And because of that, he now has a new life a new life now and a new life that will extend for eternity. 
Paul in this brief letter also tells Philemon, I could t- order you to do this. After all, I'm an apostle. You're the head of a church. But he doesn't do that. No, he's imploring him out of common faith in Jesus Christ. He's asking him not only to forgive his runaway slave, but to free him, to free him. And he actually is also more or less hints that it would be appropriate for Philemon to send Onesius back to Rome so that he could continue to help Paul in his present situation. Now, I want to take just a second and kind of stop for a moment and make this, or try to make it clear that nowhere does the Bible condone slavery. Slavery was a way of life at that time. It was not right. It wasn't right in this country when we had slavery. It, it took several hundred years. It took a bloody civil war, and it took changed hearts to free slaves. And that's what the gospel does. Its purpose is not to force. It is to change hearts. It is to instill in men and women the love for God and love for their fellow human being. And if you love your fellow human being as you love yourself, you certainly wouldn't enslave them. Well, Paul sends Onesimus back to Colossae. Onesimus, he willingly goes. He's been forgiven. He's been forgiven by God through uh, the, his faith in Jesus Christ. And he knows, he knows he could be severely punished. But he has, he has faith. He has faith in God. He also has faith in that letter that Paul wrote. That letter, when it was written was scripture. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And today, that same letter is scripture. And if we look at that letter and the rest of scripture, especially the gospels, we read, we read and we come to an understanding. We come to an understanding that we are saved by grace. We are freely forgiven, and we're called to repent, and we're called to forgive others. So let's look at a world-class Christian living according to God's word, seeks forgiveness. But in order to seek forgiveness, you first have to admit that you've done something wrong, that you need to be forgiven. There's a story about a four-year-old little girl by the name of Sarah who's been fighting all year long with her 13-year-old sister. Now, for the most part, it's been the little girl's fault, Sarah's fault. I mean, she thinks she has got everything right. She's a very, very stubborn little girl, and you put her next to a a 13-year-old, and and you're going to have problems. Well, the mother and father have tried everything to get through the Sarah to change her behavior. With Christmas coming, they decide to really, really bring into into effect the little girl's interest in Santa Claus. They tell her, you know, Santa Claus doesn't bring toys to little girls who fight with their sister. Well, that had no effect whatsoever. Well, the mother had something up her sleeve, though. She had already called the little girl's uncle, and this uncle is prepared to play Santa Claus. Well, the... Little girl's mother says, okay, Sarah, you leave me no choice. I'm calling Santa Claus right now. Now, of course, the real Santa Claus is much too busy to answer the phone, so the uncle's going to do it. The mother pushes the numbers on the phone. Meanwhile, little Sarah, now she's really, really got eyes as big as saucers, and she's listening intently. And the mother begins, Santa Claus, of course, it's the uncle. Santa Claus, I got to tell you, it's been terrible around this house. These two girls have been fighting all year long, and Sarah has really been hard to get along with, and we, you need to talk to her. So by now, Sarah is starting to get a little concerned. Well, the mother takes the phone, says, Santa Claus wants to talk to you. Well, the little girl takes the phone, puts it to her ear, and Santa Claus begins to talk, very deep very stern voice. He explained to her that there would be no presents on Christ, Christmas morning to little 
girls who fought with their sisters. He said, I'm going to be watching, and I expect to see a big change in your house or else. Do you understand? And the whole time, the little girl said, not in her you know. When she's done, she hangs up the phone, starts to walk away, and the mother says, wait a minute, come back here. What, what, did, the, what did Santa Claus say, dear? And the little girl put her head down, and she said very, very softly, very sadly, Santa Claus said that he's not going to bring any toys on Christmas morning to my sister. <laughs> well, the Bible teaches that we've all sinned, okay? Each one of us, we've fallen short of God's glory, God's expectation of us. It also teaches us that the wages of sin, the penalty for sin, is death, eternal separation from God. But, <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. In 1 John we read, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now we don't know why Onesimus ran away from his owner. Bible scholars surmise that he had stolen something very valuable, money, jewels, something very valuable. Uh, some scholars think, well, he stole that in order to, to finance his escape from Colossae to, to Rome. We, we simply don't know what he did. And when you think about it, we, we might be tempted like he was to, to justify what he did. After all, he was a slave. Maybe he resented all the valuables that his, his uh, owner had. Maybe he resented being a slave. We, we could understand that. Maybe it wasn't so much being a slave as it was he wanted those, those valuables and, and took them. We, we simply don't know. But, you know, we can do some things that aren't very nice. We can say things that aren't very nice, but we can often come up with justification reasons. This Christmas, there's going to be family with, with children who are fighting with other children. There's going to be parents who will be fighting with the children. There'll be uh, husbands and wives that will be upset with their mates, and, and harmful things will have been said, hurtful things will have been done, and we can always rationalize, we can come up with reasons and excuses as to why we do those sort of things. But the result is always the same. It's a broken relationship with someone that we should be connected with in love. Seeking forgiveness can restore our relationships. But it requires, first of all, admitting that we've gone wrong. And I want to tell you something. I talk to a lot of people. And I have yet that I, I'm going to be honest with you, I, well, let me say it this way. It's very rarely that I talk to a person and hear their side of the story, then hear the other side of the story, that there's not a little bit of blame to go on both sides. Well, the good news is that God can use our past failures, our mistakes, our poor decisions, those harmful words and hurtful actions. He can use them for the good, although they were bad. He can use them for the good. If we learn from them, if we change, and that's that second act of a world-class Christian. World-class Christian repents. Now, repentance starts with saying, I'm sorry, but that's, that's not where it, it should stop. No, it shouldn't stop with just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is a complete turning away from what's contrary to, to God's will in our lives. Repentance should be evidenced by how we're living now. If our faith is sincere and we ask for forgiveness and we believe we're forgiven, then we, we should be changing accordingly. In Acts, the 26th chapter, St. Paul emphasizes how he has preached that repentance must be evidenced, that there should, there should be a proven Repentance should be proven. Listen to what he says. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. In other words, he was transmitting what he received from the Holy Spirit. 
but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout the countryside of Judea, and also to the Gentiles. In other words, he preached the same message to everybody, that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. If we're sincere in turning away from what we've been doing, our lives will show it. We say that repentance is a 180-degree turn in how we think, how we speak, how we act. Now, if I've acted selfishly, I need to start putting others first. If I've taken things that don't belong to me, I need to stop. If I have been talking and spreading lies, I need to stop. If I've been unfaithful in my marriage, I need to stop right now. It may also involve, and usually does, restitution. It means if we've been gossiping, we need to set the record straight, go back and admit that we've, we've told an untruth. It includes what includes replacing anything that I've taken or broken as best I can. It means earning the trust of my marriage partner by living out my marriage vows fully every day. Now, those kind of changes are, are not going to be easy, and we're not going to be perfect at it, but we're called to make those changes and to strive to keep those changes in our lives. Now, for Onesimus, the risk was pretty great in keeping that repentance. He was going back to face what could be a very painful death. But he also knew he was going back to ask forgiveness of, of a fellow Christian. And a world-class Christian also forgives because a world-class Christian has sought forgiveness, has turned away from the sinful actions that, that they ask for forgiveness of, and they are willing to forgive others. As Christians, there will be some families that will be missing some members and their family get-togethers this Christmas. And uh, various reasons. Some won't be there because of death. But others won't be there because of hurt feelings, things that were said or things that were done. And for that reason, they, they won't come with the rest of the family. Or if they do come, they won't be part of the family. But you know what? Next year, they may very well be separated from their families by death. Let me remind you, as I need to be reminded of, Jesus taught, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus warns us that just being angry with our brother or sister, we're... we're we're committing murder in our hearts. He says that if you have a problem with someone that you have not resolved, and you're in worship, you ought to leave worship and go resolve that problem. That's how important it is. Because when we are alienated from someone else, it can drive a wedge between our relationship with God himself. I want to share a personal story with you. Something that happened a long time ago, not too, not too long after I had come to Trinity. I had preached at the worship service, and I was at the narthex doors of the old church greeting people on the way out. And I saw this one man coming up, and I knew he, he was a member, uh, knew he was a Christian fellow, and I also considered him a friend. Well, when he got to me, put his hand out, and I shook his hand, and he said, uh, good sermon. But then he said something else. He said something that I didn't like. Something that startled me. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it was. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you what it was. But what he said to me, it, it ruffled my feathers. And the more I thought about it, the more angry I got. I didn't just get angry. I was hurt. Now, now, when you get hurt and you're angry, then you start to get bitter. 
And I was really upset with this fellow who was my friend. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend much time with him again. I mean, after all, if that's the, what he thinks of me, I mean, that, now, it kind of had something to do with the sermon. And I thought, you know, I, 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 uh, I put my heart and soul in that sermon. I put a lot of hours in it, did a lot of research. Uh, well, why would he say something? So I brooded, fussed over it in my mind over and over. Well, I don't know when it happened, whether it was later that Sunday. I don't think it was. As a, uh, I believe it was the following morning I get a phone call from this man. And he caught me off guard. No more than I picked up that phone. I started to say hello, and he started. I am so sorry. Chuck, I should never have said what I said. I can't believe. And he went on, and, and I'm... And, you know, I hope this has happened to you. It only happens to me once in a while. But at that time, the Holy Spirit got involved. And the Holy Spirit entered my thinking and caused me to say something that I would not, wasn't ready to say. Now, he gave me these words. I wouldn't have said them on my own. So I know they came from the Holy Spirit. I said, Charlie, I'm not going to let a few words ruin our friendship. Now, wasn't that great, huh? <laughs> but I can't take any credit. He gave it to me. It just came right out. I'm going to tell you something. From that day on, Charlie Chamberlain, maybe some of you remember Charlie, became the best of friends. I mean to tell you. See, I love playing with trains, model trains, toy trains, not Charlie. Charlie was a train master. He worked with the big things. He actually ran a train yard. And he and I hit it off so well. You know, we had the trackers together. We had all sorts of things. And, and I can remember he would call me several times a week, mostly in the morning. And, and we would talk and we would laugh and we would confide in each other. You know, it, it's great for, for anyone but it's, it's even, even special for a pastor to have a, another individual that we could really confide in and trust and let our hair down. And I could do that with Charlie. We were such close, good friends. Well, I had the honor, but I also had the sad privilege of conducting Charlie's funeral. He died at the age of 48, suddenly, unexpectedly, accidentally. I want to tell you something. I am so thankful that we were reconciled before he passed away. And I'll tell you something else. I am looking forward. I am looking forward to that day when we meet in heaven and I can wrap my arms around that chubby little rascal. <laughs> and we can just talk and laugh and, and spend time together in eternity. You know, in the letter that uh, St. Paul wrote, he said, perhaps the reason that Philemon and Onesimus were separated for a little while was he might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. Who knows? Who knows, my friend? Just like Philemon and Onesimus, like Charlie Chamberlain and me, Maybe that person that you become reconciled with will free you, free that person from bitterness and anger and give you a friend for all eternity. You got somebody that needs your forgiveness? Someone you need to forgive? Do it. Do it. And you just may make or or renew a friendship for all eternity. Amen. Please stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're always anxious and ready to receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ and what he did for us. But we often fail to make the changes needed in our lives to, to live as world-class Christians. And at times we delay or withhold forgiveness of those who've wronged us. Father God, 
stir us, prod us. Don't give us any peace until we go and we are reconciled and that we can have that, that new brother, that new sister for all eternity. Amen. If I told you my story, you would hear more, you wouldn't let go. And if I told you my story, you would hear love, you never gave up. And if I told you story, you were here alive, but it wasn't mine, if I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin, but when justice was served.